Math 3, Unit 5, Section 7. Today we're talking about graphing radical equations. One thing I want to remind you guys of is that you have Desmos.com. And if we have time, we'll bring them out in class. This is a great way to check that you've made your graphs correctly when you're at home. You guys could download the app. You could do it on your computer. But it's just a nice, quick thing for you to check. Um, the way that square root equations work, and if you think about it, can I have a negative under a root and make a real number? No. And so that is why this is just basically half of a sideways parabola. Because these values down here, if you put like a negative 1 under here, you would get an imaginary number. And so that is why there's only, it seems like there's just half of a graph. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, now this works just like all of our other graphs that we've been dealing with this entire year, okay? So anytime you have a plus C here at the end, it shifts up. A minus C shifts down. What happens when you have the plus C with the X in parentheses? Very good, you guys have a good re remembering. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome for that. Okay, and then minus C goes to the right. Very good. Do you remember what happens when you have the negative in front of the function? Very good. Reflex over the x-axis. And then if you have a negative there inside the parentheses like that, it's going to reflect over the y-axis. Okay, so far so good? Okay. So we're going to talk about sketching square root functions. So they have vertexes. They are vertices. They have a starting point. Where do you think this one's going to be at? Very good. I heard someone say it. Negative 3, negative 1 is correct. So remember that whatever's under the root with the x like that, you would set that equal to 0 and take the opposite value because of the shifting. And then whatever value there is at the end, that's your y value, and that one stays the same. So that's how I got negative 3, negative 1. Anyone have questions there? No? Okay. So we are going to plot that point, and we are going to go left 3, down 1, and that's our starting point. Do you see any reflections or anything in here? Yeah, so there's like no negative x value in here. There's no negative outside. And so my curve will end up looking something like this. Okay, so far so good? All right, we're going to skip domain and range for a minute, and we're going to go straight to x-intercept. What does x-intercept mean? Where it's going to cross the x-axis. Do you remember how we find that? Very good. And so when you look at this equation right here, and I'm going to make this bigger for a minute, okay, um, and we'll have to go back down here. But I'm going to change this from f of x. I'm just going to write that as y because when I'm plugging in values, I feel like having it as y is easier for me to think about. And so when we're having finding the x-intercept, we want to keep x in our equation and we plug in 0 for y and solve. So 0 equals the square root of x plus 3 minus 1. And we're going to solve for x. What would I do to solve for x there? I heard someone say it. Add 1 to both sides. We want to get our root by itself. 0 plus 1 makes? One. Tough question, I know. 1. So I have 1 equals the square root of x plus 3. How do I get or eliminate a root? Very good. We're going to square both sides. And so when you square a square root, it eliminates the root. But whatever you do to one side, we do to the other. 1 squared is what? 1. And when we square that root, it eliminates it, and so we have 1 equals x plus 3. In order to get x by itself, now I would subtract 3 to both sides. And so what is my value for x? Good, negative 2 equals x. Um, sometimes you'll see that written as a ordered pair, and so how would I write that as an ordered pair? Not 0, negative 2, but... 
negative 2, 0. Because the x value is negative 2 and the value I plugged in for y was 0. So back to your graph over here, let's go ahead and plot that point. And we have negative 2, 0. So there is my x-intercept. Next, we're going to find our y-intercept. How do I find my y-intercept? Good. So going back to our equation right here, I am going to plug in 0 for x and keep y the same. So that means I would have y equals the square root of 0 plus 3 minus 1. What is 0 plus 3? 3. So y equals the square root of 3 minus 1. I cannot simplify that further, but I can estimate the answer into where it would be on the graph. So if I wrote this as an ordered pair, it would be 0 comma root 3 minus 1. That is the exact answer. Now, for me graphing that, it doesn't quite make sense, so I'm going to plug the values into my calculator. So I do that by finding the square root of 3. And you cannot see what I'm doing. So I press the square root button and then press 3 in and I'm going to push enter. So the square root of 3 is approximately 1.73. And then from there, we're going to subtract 1. Sorry, subtract 1. And so it's approximately equal to 0.73. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. All right. So approximately equal is when we do that like squiggly equal sign. So this could also be 0 comma 0.73 three for my y-intercept. So going back to my graph, 0.73 is right below 1, so we're going to make a point. And then now we can go ahead and draw our graph. And so it looks kind of like that. So you can notice it's curving up and going out, and that's that. So now we can go back and fill in the rest of the information. So looking at that graph, and I'm going to have to make it smaller now so we can just look at the graph and our question. Um, you can because on this one, if you had a negative 2 for x under the root, it makes a positive 1. Okay? So you, we just can't have negative values under the root. So here was like our general equation. And so any value where x is negative would not work. So in this case, it would be any negative values. On here, it starts giving negative values after negative 3. Because at negative 3, it equals 0 under the root. And so anything that makes under the root negative will not work. So this had shifting. So it's like it started at the 0, 0, and then it went left 3 and down 1. So the main idea that you need to remember is that what can't end up being under a root? A negative. And so what's happened is we have taken the original function that was right here, and we have shifted it left three down one. All we're doing is taking that graph and shifting it. Okay, and so there can't be any values that are below the negative three mark. It would be, well, if it was a negative x plus three, then it'd be a reflection. It's okay to be confused. Let's let's just deal with this question for right now, um, and then you're gonna see some reflections and stuff, and hopefully it'll make more sense too as we do more examples. But the main idea is you can't have a negative under the root. So from this point to the right, you'll get all positive values under your square root. If I chose the value of x at negative four, if I put a negative four here, negative four plus three makes a negative one. <clears throat> And that is an imaginary number and cannot be on this graph. And so that's why you won't notice there's not any values that are left of negative 3 because that's when it starts making negative values. Which brings us to domain and range. There is a specific domain and range for these types of problems. And that is telling us basically where the graph is between. So on this, what is the domain of this function? 
Good. And can it equal negative 3? Yes. And so it is negative 3 all the way till positive infinity. So any values from negative 3 on will work for our domain. Our range is dealing with our y values. Very good. And so if you look at this graph, so our smallest x value was there at negative 3. Here on the y, the smallest y value is at negative 1. And it does equal negative 1, so it's a bracket negative 1. And then even though it looks like it doesn't go up much more, it really does. If it went to infinity, the y values would end up going to infinity. So it's negative 1 comma infinity. There aren't any like asymptotes or anything on this where it's preventing it from moving. Okay. All right. Going down to D, it says open interval where F is increasing. So whenever they're talking about intervals, you're always looking at your domain. Where is everything increasing? Very good. And when they say open interval, we don't have to worry about brackets or anything like that. And so the open interval where it's increasing, the whole graph is increasing, right? When you read it from left to right, it's continuing to go up. And so the open interval where it's increasing is negative 3 to infinity. Um, then it asks, on the open interval, where is f, where is the function negative? So negative would be below the x-axis. So where is this function below the x-axis? Negative 3. And then when does it touch the x-axis? What value was that at? Negative 2. Very good. So that is where the function is negative. Just that little piece from negative 3 to negative 2. Now, average rate of change. Average rate of change is dealing with your slope the slope of the line. And so this is not a straight line. Do you guys agree? And so normally we wouldn't use slope on something like this. But there are problems where they want to know, okay, this is not an exact line, but we want to know, well, what is the average rate of change? What is kind of happening even though it's not exact? Okay, are you with me a little bit? And so from 3 to 7, so they're saying from 3 over to 7, wherever that is over here, they want, oh, you can't see what I'm doing. They want to know what is, if you were to just kind of estimate, what's the average rate of change from here to here, okay? So I'm going to show you how to do that. Are you ready? So if we're going from 3 to 7, we are saying that the x value is 3 at that point, and we want to find out what the y value is. Then we're going to do the same thing for 7. So as an ordered pair, we have the 7 is the x, and we need to find the y. And then all we're going to do is use our slope formula. Okay, and so I'm going to write the slope formula over here. But remember, m equals, does anybody remember the slope formula? Rise over run, which would be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So once we have these ordered pairs, we can plug it into this formula and find our average rate of change. Okay, so when x is 3, what are we going to do in order to find what the value is when x is 3? Good, we can plug it in. Do you already know on this graph, though, what x is when it equals 3? No, we don't, huh? Because 3, and I actually went to negative 3 over here before, but we're actually looking at positive 3, right? And so we could estimate what we think it is, but we really don't have any idea unless I actually plug it in. So plug it into our equation. So our equation is right here. So I'm going to write this as y equals the square root of 3 plus 3 minus 1. So my original equation again was y equals the square root of x plus 3 minus 1. I'm just going to write it down here. And so I just plugged in 3. 3 plus 3 makes what? 6. six. So we have the square root of 6 minus 1. What is the square root of 6? We would want to use a calculator. Let's type it in. 2.45 and then you subtract 1 and we get approximately 1.45. So I'm going to put 1.45 in for my y value. 
So that's just me typing in my calculator. I just didn't show you that part. Okay, what am I going to do to find the value for y on the 7? Plug it in as well. So we have y equals the square root of 7 plus 3 minus 1. Square root of 7 plus 3 is 10. So we have the square root of 10 minus 1. You can plug that into your calculator. I think it's like average to be like 3.16. And then we subtract 1, and we get it approximately equal to 2.16. Okay, any questions on that math? All right, so now all we're going to do is plug that into our slope formula. So if you want to go back and label these, so we have x and y, x and y. So remember, whichever point you start with, you have to make sure you start with that same point um, for both the X and the Y. So just going to highlight these so you can see them better. Okay, so Y2 minus Y1, what will I do? What numbers am I using? 2.16 minus 1.45 over... And then my x2, since I started with 2.16, I'm going to start with 7, and we go 7 minus 3. When you subtract 2.16 minus 1.45, and again, you can use your calculator, you get 0.71 divided by 7 minus 3 is 4. Normally, you don't see a problem where you have a fraction and a decimal together. So I would just end up changing this to a decimal. And 0.71 divided by 4 is approximately equal to 0.18. Do you guys agree? So this right here is my average rate of change. Any questions? Okay, we are going to try another example. So what do you notice is different about this problem from the last? There is a fraction in front. This fraction portion in front right here, that is basically making it a dilation. Do you guys remember what dilation means? It makes it smaller, and smaller and bigger. So it's just like expanding it or shrinking it. So that's what's happening with the one half in front. So anytime you have a number in front, it's going to either expand it or shrink it. Okay. Um, also, you notice there's a negative here in front. Do you see that? So do you guys remember what that negative is going to end up meaning? Very good. It's going to reflect. Also, I don't like the way they wrote this because we normally have the root part first and then the number at the end in order to find our vertex easier. So I'm going to rewrite this equation. I'm going to write it as y equals negative 1 half root x plus 4. So based on that, what is my vertex for this problem? Good. There's nothing under the root with the x, right? And so when you set that equal to 0, it's just 0. And then the y value here at the end is just 4. So 0, 4. 0 up 1, 2, 3, 4. There is my vertex. Now. There is that reflection here, so it's somehow going to look slightly different, right? Which way do you think it's going to reflect? Yeah, it's going to kind of go across the x-axis, so what's going to happen is instead of this curving up like it did on the previous graph, it's going to end up curving down, okay? But in order to do our graph, the next thing we want to do is find our x-intercept. Do you remember how to find the x-intercept? We keep the x in the problem, but we plug in 
zero for y. So zero equals negative one half root x plus four. What would you do next on this problem? You would want to try to get the root by itself, and so I would subtract four next. So that cancels. I have negative four equals negative one half root x. How do I get rid of a negative one half? Good. Multiply both sides by negative two. So when I do that, it eliminates this fraction, right? The twos cancel a negative and a negative make a positive. Negative two times negative four makes a positive eight. So I have eight equals the square root of x. How do I get rid of the square root? Very good, square both sides. So what does x equal? 64, good. As an ordered pair, that would be written as 64 comma zero. Now, on your graph right here, do I have 64 marks? Yes. Yes and no. Um, what I would do is I would put x's by, I'm gonna do tens. So that means I would go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and then 64 is in the middle there. So you, if you're gonna do something where you're changing it, all you wanna do is just state what you're changing it by, okay? So does this dilation, do you think it's making it, it's shrinking it or expanding it, making it wider? Are we able to say, is it making it bigger or smaller, do you think? Bigger. Okay. Well, I don't know. It's, maybe I'm not saying that right. Okay, anyways. Y intercept. How do I do it? Good, zero for X. So, Y equals negative one half <coughs> root zero plus four. What's zero times anything? Zero. Zero. So y equals zero plus four, which means that y equals four. And then we have that as an order pair, which is zero, four. Did we already put that on your graph? Yes. yes. If you notice that it was already there, because we already have a point on the y-axis, you could just state what the y-intercept is without actually doing the work. But if you forget and you do it, you'll just see that it's already there. Okay. So now we are going to draw our graph. Do we have a question? Okay. What is my domain on here? Where did the x's start? Zero, goes all the way till, good. My range, this is where you have to think about it a little bit. This one's gonna be slightly different. So see how on the Y it's going down? Yes? So that means for the Y it's gonna start at what? Negative infinity, and then what is the largest y value up there, four. So because of the reflection, it's starting at negative infinity because it's going down. The smallest of y value is negative infinity and then it stops there at four. Any questions? Okay, the open interval where g is decreasing. Is the whole graph decreasing? Yes, remember on intervals, the whole time you're talking about your domain, okay? And so the open interval where it's decreasing, it's the same as the domain. So it's zero to infinity, but because it says open, we don't have to worry about brackets. The average rate of change, yes. Uh, 
Um, because the square root of zero is zero and anything times zero. So because there was a zero there, I just knew that it would end up becoming zero. Okay, average rate of change, what do I do? Each of these numbers are gonna end up becoming what? You're gonna end up finding your slope, but we need these to make two different ordered pairs, correct? So, one ordered pair is going to be zero something, and then the other one is gonna be what? 16 and something, okay? So they're wanting to know between zero and 16, which would be like right here, what is that average rate of change from here to here? Okay, because we know this one by tens, right? How do I do this? What do I do next? Plug it into your original equation. Very good. So we are going to plug in zero for x, correct? Have I already done that in this problem? Yes, and when I plugged in zero for x, what did I get? Four, so I don't have to do any work on that one. I'm just gonna write the four there. Okay, did I plug in 16 for x in this problem yet? No, so we're gonna go ahead and have to do that work. So, back to your original equation, which was right up here. I'm gonna write it out as y equals negative one-half root 16 plus 4. Okay, what is the square root of 16? 4. So I have negative one-half times 4 plus 4. What is negative one-half times 4? Negative 2, and negative 2 plus 4 equals 2. So two goes in there. Now we're gonna find our slope. And so I might go back and label these as X and Y so that I don't mix anything up. When I find my slope for my average rate of change, I'm going to take my Y values first, two minus four over my X's, which is 16 minus zero. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. 16 minus 0 is 16. And then that reduces to be negative 1 eighth. Any questions? Okay, last example here. Are there any reflections on this one? No. It, it's written in the correct form, but we do know that it's going to either expand or shrink a little, right? Based on the two in front. So this value in front, that always is dealing with your dilation. Okay, so what is my vertex on this problem? Negative four, negative one is correct. Yes? If you must, yes. Negative four, negative one is my point. Okay, am I gonna be able to do my domain and range with what I have on here right now? No. Okay, so next I'm gonna find what? Very good, x-intercept. How do I find the x-intercept? Very good, plug in zero for y, but keep x. So for this equation now, in my x-intercept, we have 0 equals 2 root x plus 4 minus 1. Okay, we want to solve for x, but in order to solve for x, you need to get the root by itself. What would you do first? Add 1. 1 equals 2 root x plus 4. What will I do next? Divide by two. Now, what I usually do is I kind of think through the stuff in my head to see if it's gonna work out in a way that I want it to. If I divide by two, I'm gonna end up with what? A fraction, which will be annoying. Do you guys agree? So instead of dividing by two, it's gonna be easier for me to square both sides and leave that two there. 
Okay, so I am going to go ahead and get rid of the root by squaring both sides. When I square one, I get one. Now, this is where you have to be careful because we have to square the two. What is two squared? Four. And then I do a parenthesis, and when you square that square root, it's just going to make what? X plus four. Are there any questions about what I just did there? So if this, by dividing, is going to make it a fraction, I would suggest leaving it where it is and just making sure that you square everything. Okay? So now I'm going to distribute, and we're going to have 1 equals 4X plus 16. Because I distributed the 4, 4 times X, 4 times 4. Next, I subtract 16 to both sides. Negative 15 equals... 4x and then last I'm going to divide by 4 to both sides and so x equals negative 15 over 4. Is that easy to graph? No. So I type it in my calculator and 15 divided by 4 is what? Close. Negative 3.75. You're just kind of going the wrong direction. Okay. So on our graph, our x-intercept is negative 3.75. So it's somewhere right in between there. Okay, y-intercept. Let's find that. So we keep y in our equation. y equals 2 root 0 plus 4 minus 1. What's 0 plus 4? 4. What's the square root of 4? Two, so I have 2 times 2 minus 1, and 4 minus 1 equals 3. So my y-intercept is at 0, 3. So on our graph, 0 up, 1, 2, 3. And we can go ahead and draw that. Okay, so on this, where is the graph decreasing? None. It's not decreasing ever. Okay, where is it negative? Good. It is negative 4 to negative 3.75 because that is where it crosses the x-axis. And then last, I forgot to do the domain of range. And so going back up here, what is my domain? Where is the smallest x? Good, negative 4 to positive infinity. And the range, what is the smallest y value? Very good. Negative 1, and that goes to positive infinity. Okay, any questions?